Um, uh, now I'd like to call on uh, Professor Eric Klein, uh, who will talk about uh, 1176 BC, the year civilization collapsed. Thank you very much. You are too kind, um, but it is absolutely wonderful to be here. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I presume you can all see this. Yes, you should be looking at the front slide. Um, it is wonderful to be here, and thank you for that introduction. And um, I can tell you that your next speaker, Kirsten Newman, is going to be absolutely fabulous. So. Uh, come back to hear her next month. And if you are not already a member of AIA, I would um, second the, the notion of joining. My wife and I are actually the co-presidents of the Washington DC local society. So in about two weeks, I'll be on the other side of this microphone introducing our next speaker. So it's a wonderful organization and again, if you don't already belong, you should indeed join. We will. So, um, yeah. I'm, um, I'm very sorry I'm not actually there in person, as you might imagine. I would much rather be in um, the <laughs> warm climate of your lovely island than stuck here in snowy Washington, D.C. But I will take you up on that offer in two years and uh, we'll happily come out. But tonight, what I want to do is talk to you about 1177 BC and the collapse of the late Bronze Age uh, that took place about 3,200 years ago. Now, I had a book that came out about seven years ago that was based on this, but um, I have the pleasure tonight of giving you the updated and uh, revised version. The book that you see on the screen in the lower left there just came out on February 2nd, so it's brand new, and you are only the second audience to hear this updated version of the lecture, the first audience being the book launch on the night that it came out. So um, even if you've heard portions of this before, I have inserted some brand new stuff that uh, has just come out, including new texts that were just published a couple of years ago. So without further ado, let me get started and introduce you to what is my absolute favorite time period in history, namely the late Bronze Age, about 1700 to 1200 BC. As I say, this is my favorite period. My wife, who is also an archaeologist and ancient historian, does uh, ancient Athens of the 5th century BC. And so I always joke that I'm about a thousand years early or, or older than she is. Uh, and we argue over the dinner table about things like the Trojan War and what actually caused the plague in Athens and the sorts of things that academic couples do. So uh, this is my period near and dear to my heart and I will defend it, including to her as the best period to study in the ancient world. So what is it that I love so much about it? It is a time period that's very similar to ours today in terms of being a globalized world. And I use that with caution, not glo globalized like us today where something happens in Japan one day and it's felt 10 minutes later in New York, but that from an area um, that in today's world would be from Italy on the West to Iran and Afghanistan uh, on the east, and from what is today Turkey in the north down to Egypt uh, in the south, that whole area during the late Bronze Age was in contact and was interdependent. And in fact, I'm going to argue that it's very interdependency, even though it made for a golden age, is also what kind of led to its demise because when one of these societies or civilizations went down, the others all went down as well in the domino effect, um, just within a couple of decades or within one or two generations at most. So we've got here color, kind of color coded on this map. Uh, we've got in purple in modern day Turkey, ancient Anatolia, ancient Asia Minor. That's where the Hittites are. We've also got over here in red, we've got uh, where the Matani 
were, you've probably never heard of them, but they were a major power from the 15th to the 13th centuries. Over here in kind of the orangey color, um, that's where our Assyrians and Babylonians were in Mesopotamia. Egyptians were obviously down in Egypt. Canaanites up along the Levantine coast, basically where Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan is today. Cyprus, where the Cypriots are. And then over in Greece, Mycenaeans and Minoans. These are basically the G8 of the ancient world, as I refer to them, though there's actually nine of them if you count Minoans and Mycenaeans as separate people. So even if you're not intrinsically familiar with this period, you still know a lot of the major players, uh, even if you didn't know that you know them. So I'm going to wager a guess, and unfortunately, since I'm not there in person, I can't see you all nodding, but I'm going to assume that a fair number of you have heard of Hatshepsut, uh, one of the first female pharaohs of Egypt. You might have heard of her stepson, Tutmosis III, possibly heard of my favorite guy, Amenhotep III. You may well have heard of Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, might have invented monotheism. I don't actually think he did. It was a slightly different variant, but never mind. Um, but the one guy I'm pretty sure you've all heard of is in the lower left, namely King Tut. And then we've got Ramses II and the star of our show tonight, Ramses III. So all of these are pharaohs of New Kingdom Egypt. They are all going to be ruling during the period that we are talking about. This is also the period of the Trojan War, uh, if it took place. Uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with the Trojan War. Some of you may have even seen the film Troy starring Brad Pitt. Uh, others of you may wish that you hadn't seen the film Troy starring Brad Pitt, but I leave that up to your discretion. Uh, this would also be the context that is most likely to be the period of the exodus if we're ever able to find evidence for it. So that's the period we're going to be talking about. And as I said, during these centuries, from the 15th or even earlier, the 15th century down through the beginning of the 12th, we've got this, what I would call a globalized society for its time, where you've got all of these people interacting. And in fact, this is what uh, my wife refers to as a small world network. Uh, in her work on fifth century Greece, she actually jumped down a couple hundred years and she looks at the social networks of people like Alexander the Great and Socrates and Pericles. And so in doing this, which is um, a field known as social network analysis, they tend to draw lines in between people that are interacting. And that's what you see here. And um, in fact, with the red lines going across and moving, basically what we're trying to show here is that everyone is in contact with everyone else. They might not be directly in contact, but they are no more than one or two hops from anybody. So for example, if the Mycenaeans are not trading directly with the Assyrians, the Mycenaeans are trading, say, with the Hittites, who are trading with the Assyrians. So there's no more than one or two hops to get from one place of the network to any other one. And in fact, if you've got a network like this, which has an average of fewer than three, then that's called a small world network. So we've actually got that back in the late Bronze Age. Now I point this out again, because back then in the late Bronze Age and us today, in our world in 2021, we are two of the only times in history where there was such a globalized world system in place, even if it didn't cover the entire globe. And so there are more similarities to the late Bronze Age and its collapse and us today than you might expect. And we will come back to this at the end of the lecture. But in terms of talking about interconnections, one of the best ways I can do this is simply talk about bronze, because in order to make bronze, you need tin and you need copper. You need, in fact, 90% copper and 10% tin to make your bronze. Now, it's not a problem getting your copper. That comes from Cyprus. 
Kiprot. It actually um, gave rise to the word um, copper. But the tin is a bit of a problem. There is some tin in southeastern Anatolia. There is tin, of course, up in Cornwall, but that's a long way to go. But the majority of the tin in the Late Bronze Age seem to have come actually from off of this map, off to the right, from basically from Afghanistan, and specifically from the Badakhshan region in Afghanistan. Now, some of you may actually have some lapis lazuli jewelry. And again, I can't see you, but nod your head if you've got some. Um, and lapis lazuli comes from the exact same area as tin. They both come from the Badakhshan region. So they are um, importing tin from Afghanistan. It's going to come to the site of Mari and then go from there to Ugarit, for example, and then go over to Crete. Now, how do we know this? Because there was a tablet, a clay tablet found by the French at the site of Mari uh, in what is now Syria. In fact, ISIS occupied it and looted it. I'm not sure how much of it is still there. But one of the tablets found at Mari mentioned him being brought from Afghanistan to Mari to Ugarit. And there it is given to the Kaftorian. That's their name for the Minoans. They called Crete Kaftor. And so the Kaftorian, there are in fact translators there at Ugarit on what is now the northern coast of Syria and they would have sent the tin on. So we will come back to this because you could see that if that trade route was cut at any point and you can't get your tin anymore, then you're in trouble if what you're making is bronze. And that is, I believe, one of the things that happens at the end of the Bronze Age. So we know there are trading in raw materials, tin, copper, but also silver, which is available in Greece, for example at the Lavrion mines just outside of Athens, and gold. The Egyptians had control of the gold. Um, and in fact, some of the other kings wrote to the Egyptian pharaoh saying, gold is like dust in your land. Of course, they've got the gold mostly because they're controlling Nubia and the Sudan and all that. But basically, if you wanted gold, you had to trade with the Egyptians. Um, of them all, though, tin was the most valuable. Uh, and in fact, my colleague, Carol Bell, a British archeologist has said that for them, tin was the equivalent of oil for us today. That's how important it was. And at one point she said, getting enough tin to produce weapons grade bronze must have exercised the minds of the great king in Hattusa, that would be the Hittites up in what is now Turkey and the Egyptian Pharaoh in Thebes just like getting oil occupies an American president today. And I think that's a, a pretty good parallel for how important tin is. But they're also trading finished objects as well. Now, let me just show you two examples from these Mari letters, which are a little bit uh, earlier than the period we're gonna talk about, but they're still in the same uh, genre. These date back to the 18th century. Um, and one of the texts in Akkadian says a Kaftorian weapon, the top and the base are covered with gold, its top is encrusted with lapis lazuli. So they have imported all the way to Mari, all the way to the Euphrates in Syria from Crete, a golden dagger with a handle inlaid with lapis lazuli. Um, and the picture I'm showing you is not that dagger, that dagger has disappeared. What you're looking at actually is a dagger from the death pits of Ur, which is even earlier. Um, but I, don't, I, I want one of these. If anybody is out there, I want one of these. I've already told my students when I retire that they need to get me a letter opener that's in this shape. So, um, so this is a good example of the finished objects that they are trading. But my absolute favorite is the text that talks about one pair of leather shoes in the Kaftorian style. So these would be Minoan or Cretan shoes. And if anybody has been to Crete recently, um, you will know that what they sell there are sandals. Uh, and in some cases like in Hanya, leather boots, but these are probably sandals, leather shoes in the Minoan or Kaftorian style, which to the palace of Hammurabi, 
king of Babylon, and yes, that is the Hammurabi, as in an eye for an eye, a tooth for the tooth, and the law code of Hammurabi, that guy is getting these shoes, and it says Bakhti Lim, an official, brought them to him, but which were returned. And I've always wondered, if you're Hammurabi, why do you return these shoes? They've come all the way from Crete, and yet he returns them. Are they, I mean, are they too small? Are they too last millennium? And hadn't he heard of re-gifting, right? These didn't fit me, but they're from Crete, so here you go. But if you look through the law code of Hammurabi, all 272 or 282 laws, there is no penalty for returning gifts. So he got away with it. So uh, again, that's, that's my absolute favorite item from back then. But showing you other examples and moving down in time, if we go down into the 15th century in the time of Hatshepsut and her stepson slash nephew, Tutmosis III, in the wall paintings of the nobles from their reigns, we see Minoans and Mycenaeans on the walls bringing gifts from the Aegean. So tomb of Rekmere here, for example, and here another tomb. And look at the guy on the right there with the bull's head that he's carrying. That's totally Minoan. It can't come from anywhere else. And actually we know that's where it comes from because in these tombs, they frequently have inscriptions and they say things like gift of the prince um, from Keftiu, which is their name for Crete. So Mesopotamians called Crete Taftor, Egyptians called it Keftiu. So these are um, evidences of trade embassies, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, there would have been a special occasion, maybe one of the um, festivals for Tutmosis III, uh, because we see not just people from the Aegean, but people from elsewhere uh, also in these same tombs. And we also know that they are sending ships. They are trading um, via maritime voyages. I give you just one example here because we're pressed for time. If it were up to me, I'd, I'd spend the next five, six, seven hours talking to you, but you probably have other things to do. So I'm gonna keep each of these brief. So here's one example that we call the Cineranu text. Dates to about 1260 BC. Uh, Cineranu was up in Ugarit, that same place where we had the Kaftorians getting the tin. And the tablet that was found in Ugarit, uh, again by the French, it says, from the present day, Amastamru, son of Nikmepa, the king of Ugarit, exempts Sinaranu, the son of Siginu, his grain, his beer, his olive oil to the palace, he shall not deliver. His ship is exempt when it arrives from Crete. So what we've got is this private merchant, Sinaranu, who is sending a ship from what is today the coast of North Syria down to Crete and back again. And he is importing from Crete grain, beer, and olive oil. And what the king has just done is said he doesn't have to pay import tax, right? So this is maybe one of the earliest examples of, of a corporate tax exemption, if you want to put it that way. But for our purposes, it is enough to show that there is trade going back and forth across the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. And if that written text isn't enough proof, we've actually got a shipwreck from that time period. This is the Ulebrun ship. It went down off the coast of Turkey somewhere around 1300 BC. George Bass and Jamal Pulik excavated it in the 80s and early 90s. You see here a black and white picture of the um, ship on the seabed floor. This is about 140 to 170 feet deep. So um, off the diving charts, they were only able to go down for 20 minutes a day, two times a day, but they managed to excavate the whole ship. And you're seeing here stone anchors running down the hull and on either side, copper ingots pure, 99% pure copper ingots, which um, the metallurgical analysis has shown are coming from Cyprus. There are more than 300 ingots on board this one ship. Um, that is 10 tons of copper. There's also a ton of tin on board. And George Bass at one point 
estimated that that amount of copper and tin is enough to outfit 300 soldiers with swords, shields, greaves, everything you need. So for me, this one ship that went down at about 1300 BC is a microcosm of the globalized world at that time, because on board that ship, there are items from at least seven different cultures. So we've got Hittite stuff on there. We've got Egyptian, Canaanite, Cypriot, Assyrian, Mycenaean, Minoan, Italian, and even a couple items from, uh, or at least one item from up in the Balkans. So here you can see top left, some of the tin objects, bottom left here, parabinth resin from pistachio trees used in perfume, uh, elephants and hippo ivory, brand new pottery from Crete, uh, sorry, from Cyprus and Canaan, and among my favorite objects up here, top right, raw glass ingots. These colored with cobalt, so they're blue, but there are others that are a rosé color, others that are yellow, others that are brown. And so when the ship went down, somebody lost a fortune. I really hope that they were insured. So this is what National Geographic published. And again, to me, it really um, epitomizes the international nature of this particular period. The ship itself went down here uh, at Koch, Ula Barun, but it was probably going around and around the Mediterranean at that time. So we actually have another text found in Egypt in the Amarna archive, uh, time of Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, about 1350 BC, give or take. And it's a letter from the King of Cyprus that says that he is sending him 200 talents of copper. Now, each of those ingots on the Ula Brun shipwreck, we think might have represented an ancient talent. It weighs about 60 pounds. So the Ula Brun ship is not this ship because we've got 300 on the Ula Brun, and here he's sending 200. But it's enough to show that they are sending raw metals around uh, at that time. So raw metal, finished goods, everybody's happy. Um, trade is flourishing, life is flourishing, uh, 1500, 1400, 1300, and then boom, right after 1200 BC, everything comes to a shrieking halt. Um, round about 1290, 1280, sorry, 1190, 1180, and down to 1177, uh, everything falls apart. Just one civilization after another. And so that's what I was studying is what happened? Why did this take place? Now, in examining the collapse of um, a society or a civilization, of course, I'm not the first one to do it. Um, Edward Gibbon probably gets that. Uh, some of you may have read his little paperback, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, light reading on an evening if you want. Um, but others may have read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, much more recently. Uh, and then Joseph Tainter in the middle, the collapse of complex societies. The difference between what they did and what I was trying to do in my book is that they were examining single civilizations. Even Jared Diamond and Collapse takes a different civilization in each chapter. In my book, I'm examining the collapse of all eight or nine societies or civilizations at the same time, which is pretty much unique in the history of our world. The magnitude was catastrophic. As my kids would say, it was ginormous. Uh, and really, we're not going to see such a catastrophe again until the fall of the Roman Empire. And that took place 1,500 years later. Um, I will not, of course, point out the obvious fact that we are at about 1,500 years on from the collapse of the Roman Empire. And I would never deign to say that maybe this happens every 1500 years and perhaps we should be worried. But of course, I wouldn't think of ever saying that. Instead, what I want to do is take a look and see what caused the collapse, because this has been debated for decades now, uh, if not longer. The original hypothesis was that the end of the Late Bronze Age was brought about because of a number of groups that we collectively called the Sea Peoples. Um, and we, in this case, being some early French Egyptologists. 
Now, we know from the Egyptian records, that's where we get all of this, from the texts of the fifth year of Merneptah and the eighth year of Ramses III, that these groups, these sea people, came twice. So the fifth year of Merneptah is about 1207 BC, and the eighth year of Ramses III is, by, to all accounts, 1177. And that's where I got the title of my book. Be aware, of course, that Egyptian chronology, depending on who you're talking to, can vary. Um, so the original title for my book was 1186. And then by the time I was done writing it, I decided I liked Ken Kitchen's chronology. So I changed it to 1177. Actually, a better title for the book would have been The Eighth Year of Ramses III. Then there wouldn't have been any problem. But um, that didn't fit on the cover of the book. So. At any rate, this is what we've got in 1177. Uh, Ramses III on the wall of his mortuary temple at Medinet Habu, rather blurry here, and I apologize for that, but he shows us this second invasion of the Sea Peoples. And when Gaston Maspero, one of these early French Egyptologists that I referred to, he took a look at this and he said, ah, Sea peoples, they invade, it's the end of the Bronze Age. They're probably the ones that caused all the devastation. And he suggested that just as a hypothesis in about 1860, but by 1901, it was solid and everybody accepted it. So they said, every time any archeologist found um, a site that had been destroyed, they said, oh, the sea peoples did it. But of course, this is not the way you're supposed to do archeology span uh, and in fact, um, I'm not sure that they were the single culprits, let's say, and I'll come back to this in just a minute. But to show you what Ramses III tells us, we've got a lot of information. It says the foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms. And then he tells us the, um, he tells us the countries and the areas that they overran. So he says, from Hate, Kode, Karkamish, Artsua, and Alashia on. Well, we know where these are. Hate, those are the Hittites up in Anatolia. Kode, that's basically where today, um, Kode and Karkamish are both where Turkey meets Syria today. Um, Artsua is over on the western coast of Anatolia. Alashia, that's Cyprus. So they're kind of sweeping across what we would see today as Turkey and Cyprus. And then he says a camp was set up in one place in Amur. Well, that's Amuru, that's Northern Syria. So we know where they're coming. And then he tells us who they are. Remember the name Sea People was simply made up by Maspero uh, in French. They didn't call them that back um, in the Egyptian period. They actually give us the names of the individual groups. So they say they were the Palesa, the Tajekur, the Shekelet, the Denyan, and the Weshesh, and they all came united. But the Egyptians were able to beat them. They defeated them. And Ramses, a couple of years later, in year 12, says, I overthrew those who invaded from their lands. I slew the Denyan, the Tajekur, and the Palesa were made ashes, and so on. So... Marnepta had already beat the first wave back in 1207. Ramses now beats the second wave. There will not be a third wave. That's it. Sea peoples never come back. But it was a Pyrrhic victory because even though Egypt won, they were really never the same again. The rest of the 19th dynasty, 20th dynasty into the 21st and 22nd is a very much weakened Egypt. So um, 18th, 19th dynasties, at least to my mind, was their high point. So Egyptians do win, but it was at a cost. But they show us what the sea peoples look like on that mortuary temple. Uh, and they also talk, as I say, uh, about who they actually were. And we, archaeologists and ancient historians, have been playing a guessing game for decades now, trying to link them. So for instance, um, many people suggest that the Shardana may have come from Sardinia, and they look at the names and say, it looks a little familiar. Same thing with the Shekelech, it looks a little bit like Sicily. Now, this may be accurate, it may not be, 
Um, the tajekar, though, if we're going to continue, that's harder. Could be the sickle. It could be from around Troy, Troad. Many people think the Denyan might be Homer's Danaans, the um, the other name for the Mycenaeans, right? Agamemnon and all those guys. Weshesh could be similar to the Hittite name for Troy, which is Wilusa, which actually is very similar to the Greek Ilios, because Ilios originally would have been Wilios, and the digamma dropped out. So the actual name for Troy in both Hittite and um, early Greek was probably about the same. So maybe the Wachos are from there, but really the only one that we know and that we're confident about are the Peleset. And these are the Philistine. And already um, Tempoleon, the guy who deciphered hieroglyphics, he had already suggested that maybe the Peleset were the Philistine. Uh, and indeed, very recently, um, and by recently, I mean July, 2019, there was DNA analysis published from four infants found at the site of Ashkelon in modern day Israel. And in those four infants who are buried underneath the floors of some houses, they are of mixed parentage. They have local Canaanite DNA and they have foreign DNA up to 68%. And the computer models suggest that the foreign DNA most closely match Crete and Sardinia. So they may not be Philistines, though that's what the pottery suggests, but they may certainly be that, in which case, who knows? But we've definitely got somebody intermarrying the local Canaanites from probably Crete or Sardinia, and those are regions where we've got um, the Sea Peoples coming from. And indeed, if you know your uh, Old Testament of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, uh, it says that the Philistines come from Crete. And so, who knows? Maybe we've actually got confirmation of that from DNA. So, regardless, um, the pottery, the Philistine pottery, like you see here on the right, it looks like Mycenaean pottery. It's what I would call degenerate Mycenaean, because it looks like the pottery from mainland Greece, but now it's, now it's made with local clay. It's made with clay from the Levant or Cyprus. So it really does look like the Philistines came from the Aegean and then settled down in this region. But I hasten to say that this is not a raid. It's not testosterone laden men on a raid um, like the Vikings sometimes did, but a movement of people and I know that Vikings frequently came with all of their families. Um, so if that's the case, then this is similar. You can see on the left here, part of the picture at Mednet Habu from Ramses III. Upper right is an artist's rendition. And then lower right is um, um, akin to an ethnographic parallel from today. But basically what we're looking at is people moving with all of their families. Um, husband, wife, kids, luggage on the carts. This is a movement. It's not an invasion. And I would say, if we're looking for modern parallels, it's probably something like the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, where everybody's moving from, say, Oklahoma to California. And in terms of our world today, uh, another parallel might be the refugees that have been fleeing from the Civil War in Syria. So movements of entire people, not necessarily aggressive, but being pushed out of one place for whatever reason, war, drought, famine, and making their way towards a better life in some other area. So it was frequently said before that maybe they were being pushed out of Sicily, Sardinia, Northern Italy because of a drought, which caused famine, that caused the sea peoples to move. They cut the trade routes and that's what led to collapse. And indeed, I think that this is part of what happened, but since I think the sea peoples are as much victims as they were oppressors, I think that this is far too simple. This may well have happened, but it's just part of what went on. So that's what I was trying to figure out is what really happened. So to remind you, 
we had this nice globalized society. Everybody's trading, everybody's doing diplomacy, uh, reciprocity, and now you've got some chaos dropped in just after 1200 BC. And very quickly, and one after the other, everybody goes away, basically, except for Egypt and Assyria to a certain extent. But really, Egypt is the survivor. So they're all gone within just a couple of decades after 1200. And then the question, as I've said, is what caused it? So it used to be the Sea Peoples got blamed, but there were other suggestions. Drought, some said, famine, some said, invaders, earthquakes. And so if you ask me which of these was the cause, I would say yes. Yes, they all were. I think it's a perfect storm. Because, and I think you'll probably agree with me, that if a massive earthquake hits, lots of people are going to die, but it normally doesn't end a society or a civilization. Same thing with invaders, same with famine, same with drought. These are all terrible things when they happen, but it doesn't usually bring a society to an end. There's usually survivors. But what happens if you have more than one happening at the same time? or one after the other. What if you have a drought and famine and invaders and earthquakes? At some point, you're going to throw up your hands and just go, Dianu, no, enough. I give up. And I think that's what happened. I think we've got a series of unfortunate events here, and it was a perfect storm. And that's what brought them down, because I don't think they had time to recover from one catastrophe before the next one hit. So let me just give you very briefly some examples I want to run through to show you the evidence that we've got. So for instance, drought, that's been suggested for a very long time. Reese Carpenter suggested it back in 1966, that that's what ended the Mycenaeans on mainland Greece, but he didn't have the data. It was just a hypothesis. Well, now we have the data. We have what Reese Carpenter was looking for. Kaniyutsky, he's a, a, a French scholar, um, went with his team to Gibala in North Syria, just south of Ugarit. They did coring in the lagoon there and retrieved the pollen. And it turned out that the pollen from a time period of just after 1200 BC, uh, the end of the 13th, beginning of the 12th century, down to the 9th century, 300 years, the pollen is from plants that survive in arid conditions. And so he hypothesized in a paper published in 2011 that there was a 300 year dry event. Now that's jargon for a drought and 300 year drought, that actually is what we call a mega drought. So he found it in North Syria. He then jumped over to Cyprus, did the same thing at Hala Sultan Teke, found the same thing. Another 300 or so year mega drought and Lee Drake um, pulled together a bunch of different studies and said, well, it's actually not just Syria and Cyprus. There's also evidence in Greece. And in fact, over in Italy, it was Aegean and Mediterranean wide. Uh, and then uh, Daphne Langut, you see her here in the lower right, and Israel Finkelstein plus Thomas Litt, they did the same thing. They went coring at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee and the western shore of the Dead Sea bingo, drought there also. But it wasn't as long. It was only about 150 years. So a mini mega drought, I suppose you could call it. Uh, and now most recently, uh, Christian Christensen has published evidence for a drought in Northern Italy at about 1200 BC with a massive migration of up to 120,000 people that left. And it may be that we're looking here at the beginnings of the Sea People. So to be fair, there's never been a site that's been identified as the origins of the Sea Peoples. If I had a million dollars and an unlimited permit, I would totally go over to Sicily, Sardinia, Northern Italy, looking for the Sea Peoples. But more evidence now has come out from Greece in a cave um, that's down by Pylos. Martin Finet and his colleagues, um, hold on, this is going away, there we go. Martin Finet and his colleagues looked at a stalagmite, and that shows evidence 
for a drought. Uh, if you look at the lower right hand chart down here in the purple and the green, you're looking at major drought in Greece. So there's lots and lots of evidence now, all that has come out since about 2011. Uh, and indeed, much of it's come out since 2014, which is why I had to rewrite the book because I had to put all this data in. So we now have everything you've got with the red dot here, that is evidence for the drought. Uh, and you can see this map um, goes from Northern Italy all the way over um, into Iran. Uh, and we've got evidence from all kinds of places, from the bottom of lakes and lagoons to caves, to even the Nile is affected as well. So um, it's, I'd say beyond a doubt now that you've got a drought. And in fact, when these studies were reported, the major media um, published studies or, or stories on all of them, New York Times, LA Times, National Geographic, our very own archeology span magazine from AIA, um, my absolute favorite, though, is the New York Post that not only put in um, the drought as climate change, but tossed in globalization for good measure as having ended the late Bronze Age. So we definitely have, uh, have drought, no problem there. Famine is a little harder to find. You need to find like dead bodies in a pit usually, um, but you can find them in written text. And that's what we've got. So let me take you back briefly to Ugarit again in northern Syria. French have been excavating there um, and have found lots and lots of tablets, including this particular one, which was talking about a famine in the city of Imar, which is inland. Um, this guy, Ortenu, you can see his name here. He's another merchant like Sinaranu. Um, and he was doing so well that he had a branch office in Imar. This is a letter from one of his employees saying, we've got a famine in Imar. There's a famine in our house. We will all die of hunger. If you don't arrive here, um, we're going to die of hunger. You won't see anybody. So there's definitely famine in Imar. There is also famine in Ugarit itself. This is one of the brand new tablets that was just published um, in French in 2016. And my friend Yuri Cohen has an English translation that's coming out that he gave me permission to quote and to show you. And it is a letter here from Pharaoh Seti II up to the King of Ugarit, quoting a letter back to him. You had written to me in the land of Ugarit, there is severe hunger. May my Lord save the land of Ugarit. May the King give grain to save my life and to save the citizens of the land of Ugarit. This is the first evidence we have for famine in Ugarit itself. And Seti did send a rescue mission. He sent a ship which had 7,000 dried fish on it. Um, the guy had actually asked for grain. He didn't ask for dried fish, but I guess you send what you can. Um, we've also got others here. This is another new one from uh, a citizen of the city to the King of Ugarit. Um, grain staples from you are not to be had. The people of the household of your servant will die of hunger. Give grain staples to your servant. So we've got more and more evidence for famine in Ugarit. We've also got evidence for it elsewhere. These are various letters from the Hittite king up in Anatolia. Do you not know there was a famine in the midst of my land? Here with me, plenty has become famine. It's a matter of life and death. And indeed, the Egyptians, who had been the enemies of the Hittites, not so long ago, Battle of Kadesh, 1279, they were like mortal enemies. And yet, the Egyptians come to the aid of the Hittites in this time of need. And indeed, it looks like the Egyptians may have anticipated this situation to a certain extent. Uh, Israel Finkelstein and others have now shown that Egypt, in its lands in Canaan, was planting uh, drought-resistant crops and that they had interbred cattle uh, that would be more hardy. So it does like they looked like the Egyptians knew what was coming and tried to stave it off, but too little, too late. But we've definitely therefore got drought. We've definitely got famine. We've also got invaders. 
that's for sure. We have a very famous tablet from Ugarit talking about ships of the enemy that have been seen, um, seven ships in particular. But we've also now got another one of these brand new tablets, which tells us even more. I wrote to you once, twice, thrice news regarding the enemy. May my Lord know now that the enemy forces are stationed in um, Rashu, which is modern Ratsibanhani, that's Ugarit's port, and their avant-garde forces were sent to Ugarit. May my Lord send me forces and chariots and save me. So this brand new tablet is showing that an unnamed enemy, presumably one of the Sea People's groups, overran the port of Ugarit and was now on its way, the avant-garde forces were on their way to Ugarit. We know Ugar was destroyed by humans. There are arrowheads in the walls. There are bodies. There's um, a meter, three feet deep of ash. So it may be that this tablet uh, is showing what's about to happen. So we definitely have invaders. And other letters also talk about the enemy um, coming in, humiliating the army, sacking the city, and so on. And indeed, Kaniyuski at Tel um, Gibala, he thought he actually had evidence of the Sea Peoples, but there's no sign there, and we don't know for sure. So this may be wishful thinking in his publication to say Sea Peoples Lair. But then again, it might be. On the other hand, I give you very briefly the example of Hatzor in Canaan, northern Israel today, because that city was definitely destroyed. The palace is burnt to a crisp, and it happens um, somewhere between about 1230 and 1180. But the destroyers did not leave a calling card. So there are two co-directors there. Amnon Bentor says that they were not Egyptians or um, Canaanites that destroyed it, because in the destruction, there are defaced statues, both Egyptian and Canaanite. And he says Egyptians wouldn't have defaced their own statues. Canaanites wouldn't have de um, defaced them. So for him, it's either Israelites or sea peoples. And he said Hatzor is too far away from the, from the sea. Probably not sea peoples, he said. I might disagree, but never mind. So for Ben Tor, he said it's the Israelites, specifically uh, under Joshua, like the Hebrew Bible says. But his co-director, Sharon Zuckerman, who unfortunately passed away uh, a couple of years ago, she's like, wait, hold on, Amnon, wait, not so fast. What is actually destroyed at Hathor? Um, and he says, well, the palace is destroyed. She's like, yeah, what else? He says, the temples are destroyed. She's like, yeah, what else? And he says, well, that's about it. And she says, the private housing weren't destroyed. The lower city's not destroyed. And he says, no. She says, you don't have invaders you have an internal rebellion. You've got the lower class rising up, maybe because there's drought, maybe because of famine. She's like, that's why the palace and the temple is destroyed, but not the private houses. You've got an internal rebellion. And we may have something similar at, at Mycenae also. So I also give you this then to say that even though a city is destroyed, we don't necessarily know who did it. And if the two co-directors of Hatsor can't decide who destroyed their city, I don't know how we're going to. So invaders, maybe. Internal rebellion, maybe. But it could also be, and not necessarily at Hotsor, but elsewhere, could also be mother nature, because it's very hard to tell an earthquake from human destruction in many cases. So here's a map, for example, of all of the, or most of the cities destroyed at the end of the late Bronze Age. And if you overlay this on a map that shows earthquakes that have happened in the same region in just the last century, you can see that we're talking, we're, it's an active seismic zone all over this region. And indeed, if you look at the fault lines, you've got the North Anatolian fault line in light blue, you've got another fault in green coming down the side of Greece, you've got the Great Fault coming up the Rift Valley, um, through modern day Israel, which forms, um, you know, Lake Tiberias and the Dead Sea. So this is an active fault zone everywhere 
including Anatolia and elsewhere. And I show you right here, the city of Mycenae with the famous Lion Gate. But these over here, what looks like bedrock on the left underneath the wall, that's actually one half of an earthquake fault zone. That's what it looks like. And when the archaeoseismologists came here, they started laughing. They're like, who built their city right on top of a major fault line? And then one of the seismologists said, well, actually, I teach at Stanford. I live in San Francisco. And uh, I think we kind of did the same thing. So um, not unusual. But at Mycenae, therefore, we've got here the skeleton. It's the same skeleton in both pictures. But you see the archaeologist digging it up here. And over here, I wanted to show you the rock here. That rock caused this young lady's death. She was standing in the doorway, and the whole house collapsed in the earthquake. That rock shattered her skull. So that is an earthquake victim at Mycenae. Same thing at Tiryns. We've got, kind of hard to tell here, but the skeleton of a woman and her child underneath a fallen wall at Tiryns. And then if we jump across to Troy, here is one of the walls from Troy 6. And trust me, that wall is not supposed to look like that. That's what happens when you have an earthquake and it's now tilting over. And we know that Troy 6 is destroyed by an earthquake. Even at Ugarit, that's what happens when you've got an earthquake where it goes all askew. So it may be that some of the destructions are caused by an earthquake rather than by human beings. But of course, then we come back to what I referred to at the beginning. What if some or all of these end up cutting the trade routes? And if you can't get your tin anymore, you can't make your bronze. Now, iron does not begin until the end of the late Bronze Age. Sea peoples do not have iron. That's a myth you'll see on the internet sometimes. Uh, the Hittites don't have it. That's another myth. Really, they don't start inventing and using iron until they had to, until the tin was gone. So the end of the Bronze Age then, I think, is pretty much all of these factors combined. So uh, since we're basically almost out of time here, let me wrap up by just making a couple final statements that I think you'll agree with, uh, and then we'll see where that leaves us. So my first statement would be um, that we've obviously got a number of separate civilizations at this time, right? Hittites, Egyptians, Babylonians, they're all independent, but they are interacting with each other, especially trading, right? International trade. Secondly, it's very clear that many of these cities were destroyed and that pretty much life as they knew it came to an end around about 1177. But it's also clear that we don't know what caused it. Is it humans? Is it mother nature? Is it all of the above? So we're stuck here with what I would call one of history's mysteries. And that's why I would say that for those people that are still doing this linear equation, that that is, no, it was much, much messier. I think you've got all of this stuff drought, famine, earthquakes, invaders, rebellions, each of these stressors forced the different societies to react in different ways. But the ultimate reaction was either you survived and transformed, or you didn't and you disappeared. Most of them did not and they disappeared. Some were able to transform, but it took a couple of hundred years. Egyptians, for example, Neo-Assyrians, Neo-Hittites, but the big eight or nine, they go away, and life as they knew it ended. And I say it's because of them being globalized, that they were perhaps too dependent. Had they been more self-sufficient, they might have survived, but they weren't. So when one debt went down, the others followed soon afterward. So we have a name for this. This is a systems collapse. Um, Colin Renfrew coined the term back in 1979, and he said it's when you see the collapse of your central administration, it's when your traditional elite think the one percent, they disappear, your centralized economy collapses, and you get lots of population decline, like up to 75 percent of the people dying, and the rest moving, migrating, shifting. 
And the thing about a systems collapse is it actually doesn't happen in one year. It can take up to a century. And that's why 1177 for me is just shorthand for this whole couple of decades or even up to a century. And what uh, Renfrew said is in the aftermath, you get a transition to a lower level of socio-political um, uh, cities and such. And you get dark age myths. Think Homer, think Iliad and Odyssey, where they talk about the golden age that had just disappeared. And so I think this is a perfect system collapse that we are seeing at the end of the late Bronze Age. So since I'm a historian and archeologist that think we can learn from the past, if we're uh, listen, willing to listen to it, let me ask you, do you think we are today facing a similar situation that they did back in 1177? Do we have climate change? Yeah. Are there famines and droughts in the world? Yeah. Earthquakes, for sure. Rebellions, yes. The only thing missing maybe are the sea peoples and even them, we might have them as also. So what I would say is um, if we looked at newspapers from our present day, say from 2008 until the present day, some of the headlines that we've had are Greece's economy tank as of 2008. You've had the Arab Spring, which engulfed Egypt and Libya and elsewhere. Syria's had its civil war. Turkey has become involved. Jordan's got refugees. This is all the news from our last, say, 15 years. If they had had newspapers back just after 1200 BC, I think the headlines would have been pretty much identical. So I do think that we are in a situation today very similar to what they had back then. Um, they collapsed. So what are we you know, going to do about it? So I had an interview um, with Adam Frank of NPR when the book first came out in 2014. And I kind of blithely said to him, well, it's not going to happen to us today because unlike the Hittites, we're now advanced enough to understand what's happening. You know, the Hittites, they didn't know how to stop the drought. Maybe they prayed to the storm god, maybe they didn't. So I said, we're much more advanced and we can take steps to fix things. And he just devastated me with his aunt, with his response. He said, yeah, okay, fine. But are we advanced enough to do anything with our understanding? And I would remind you that not only does it remain to be seen whether we are advanced enough to do anything with our understanding, but that Mark Twain reportedly said, history might not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. So I'm a little concerned about what's going on today. And on that pessimistic note, I will end and I thank you for your attention.